All righty. Hello, Foreman community. Welcome back to another community demo. Uh, my name's Ian Ballou. I'm taking Nofar's place this time since she couldn't present the community demo. Uh, we have a bunch of great demos for you all lined up today. Uh, let's uh, dive right in. Um, there aren't any announcements to be had, so we can just jump right into the demos. And we'll just remind you all, um, normally this is live, so ordinarily there would be live chat on the YouTube link. But uh, for anyone catching this on the recording, feel free to send any comments and any questions there, and we'll be happy to answer them. But you can also catch us uh, on Matrix at the Foreman. And we also have our community website, uh, community.theforeman.org. So the agenda for today, we got a list of nice demos. Um, first up, Jeremy will be giving us a reminder that simple content access will be the only subscription management option in Catello 4.12, or should I say lack of subscription management option. Um, and then Jeremy will also be showing off the new manifest expiration warnings. After that, I'll be talking about some improvements for our smart proxy container registry. After that, Bastion will be talking about his Foreman resource quota plugin. And then lastly, uh, Jeremy will be talking about a more developer focused demo of adding custom columns to our brand new host listing page that is written in React. All right, I will stop sharing my screen. And Jeremy, I will kick it off to you. OK, let me quickly share here. Hopefully, everyone can see my slideshow here. Please let me know verbally if not. Um, so hey, everyone. I'm Jeremy from the Catello team. Just. Um, sort of rehashing this announcement I didn't get to make on the previous demo because it was canceled. Um, so if you are upgrading to Catello 412 or Foreman 310 with Catello, uh, simple content access is going to be the only entitlement uh, mode available. So entitlement mode will be removed in Catello 412. All organizations are going to be migrated to SCA during the upgrade. And then, of course, toggling SCA will not be possible in Catella 4.12 plus. Uh, so just a quick refresher on what SCA is. Uh, bottom line is Catello no longer does subscription counting for you. Subscriptions live only in your manifest now. You're not going to see them anywhere else. There's no need to attach subscriptions to activation keys or hosts. Uh, and overall, I think it's just a much simpler workflow for access to content. Um, so just a quick comparison of the old way and the new way. So the old way, this is uh, before Catello 4.9, I think. You'd have to disable any custom repositories if, if you needed to. And then you'd have to enable Red Hat repos and attach a subscription to your host. And that's how you got uh, your host access to content. With SCA, the steps are very similar, except there's no step three. It's just two steps. Um, and so nowadays, uh, since the default enablement of custom repos is now disabled, you'll need to enable them if needed. Uh, and that way, you, you won't have uh, any surprises when you're adding new custom repos. You still get to choose what your host get access to when you add a new custom repository. And then you enable Red Hat repos, and then you're done. There's no, uh, there's no step three, as they say. Uh, so along with this, there's some little bits removed in 4.12. Obviously, the checkboxes on the organization create and edit screens are going to be gone. Um, and then your host status list is going to be a lot shorter because we've removed these five statuses that are now irrelevant uh, around system purpose attributes. Um, just a note, we're not removing system purpose attributes themselves. Those are still useful. We, we just removed the statuses around them that told you whether they were supported by a subscription or not. And then API endpoints uh, won't work anymore. There's a couple that were related to SCA. And then I believe the hammer command 
uh, change might not have made it into 412, but that'll be in 413, and you'll get an error until then uh, if you try to toggle SCA with Hammer. Uh, we've also added some new ish features to make uh, SCA easier. Uh, quite a while back, we added OS and architecture restrictions for custom repositories. So you can uh, choose, well, if you're on RHEL, at least you can choose which uh, RHEL OS you want the repository to work with. And then you can choose the architecture regardless of OS. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, custom products are now disabled by default. Uh, and then as far as reporting, the subscription general report has been enhanced with um, subscription expiration dates. Um, I think Samir demoed that in a previous demo. And then the host installed products report is going to replace the subscription entitlements report. Subs subscription entitlements report didn't work with SCA because it relied on subscription attachments. But the host installed products report gives you a lot of the same information, just in a, a little different way. It just tells you what the installed products are that would have required those subscriptions. So, and it's got all the sysPurpose attributes in there too. So that's useful. Uh, so that is the mini announcement about SCA. And I'll see if there's any questions here. Doesn't look like it, so I'll go ahead and move on to my technical demo. Um, I think I can just share a tab here, so let me do that. Okay, so uh, my next demo is I want to tell you a little bit about um, improvements we've made around uh, manifest expiration warnings. So as you may know, the way you use Red Hat content or a Red Hat software in Foreman and, and Catello is by uploading a manifest. And this manifest contains subscriptions, which is what we're looking at here. And you can then use those subscriptions to enable Red Hat repositories and give your host access to content. So one of the biggest point points, pain points around this uh, up until now was what we call manifest expiration. Um, in candle pin terms, it's actually called the uh, expiration of your upstream consumer identity certificate. But in Catello, we try to make it a little easier. We just say your manifest is expired. Um, and so what would happen is, if I switch to my organization here that has an expired manifest, um, you get this toast notification here. And uh, this is this is not a notification you want to get because there's a lot of pain associated with this. What this means is your hosts lose access to all of the content. Uh, this happens even if you're using SCA, and it happens even if every single subscription in that manifest is still valid. Um, your if your manifest is expired, it's uh, it's no good. Uh, and then if you're not using SCA, it's even more painful because then once you uh, import a new manifest to fix the issue, you then have to reattach all your subscriptions to hosts and activation keys. Uh, but even without that, it's still pretty painful. So the first change we've made to improve things is we've added this nice little alert here. When you do have an expired manifest, you'll see this. Uh, it tells you what happened and what you should do about it. And then we also show the manifest expiration date on this manage manifest screen here. We never showed that before. Um, so if I switch to my default organization here, so the, um, the biggest improvement we're making here is we're now going to warn you before your manifest expires. And that's actually going to be controlled by a setting. Uh, it's under content. And it's it's actually an existing setting called expire soon days. Uh, so normally, you'd set this to something normal like 90 or 120. But I'm going to set it to a really high number just so I can show you. And then if I go back to my subscriptions here. So this is my default organization. I have a manifest in here that's not yet expired. If I go here, now we see a warning that says your manifest will expire in X number of days. And it tells you what to do about it. 
Uh, the other big improvement that we made here is that refreshing your manifest will now extend the expiration date. So um, right now you can see this expires March 22nd. If I refresh, uh, after that refresh is complete, um, we're gonna see a different expiration date up on there. And then uh, the other improvement we've made is the uh, little bell notification we added. Um, so that, that will, uh, show up in your notifications if you have a manifest that's about to expire. And I think that was about it for this part of the presentation. Let's see what that chat was here, if there's any questions. Oh, right, yeah, the restrict to OS architecture. Okay, great. Anything else? That's it for me for now, and uh, I'll be back a bit later. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Great demo as always. Yeah, hopefully this will catch anyone who didn't see our previous announcements or read the release notes. All righty. So up next, I'm going to be giving a demo about some performance improvements that are nearly ready. Let me share my screen. Beautiful. OK, so for anyone who uses container content, uh, you might know that our smart proxy also has a container registry. So if you sync container content to your smart proxy, you can also do your podman polls from there to consume content. Now, this container registry, and I'll go to the main repo here. It's called the Container Gateway. Um, it's a separate code base from the container registry that runs on Catello. It's its own implementation of a container registry. Container registries are relatively simple to implement, especially with the new OCI uh, spec. There aren't that many endpoints that you need to implement. However, in this implementation of the Container Gateway, um, we do have a database. And that database is pretty much only there to limit access to repositories based on the uh, user settings that you might have uh, in your foreman. If users shouldn't be able to access these repos on the main foreman, they also shouldn't be able to access them on the smart proxy. And some users who have incredibly large environments have hit performance issues because we're using uh, SQLite, and the database would uh, return a busy error because there were too many clients trying to log in at the same time. And so, um, with some help from my colleague about, uh, we've made some improvements to the queries and also have added Postgres support to the container gateway. And so in the readme, there is now some information about uh, how to enable Postgres. And in testing, I found that the Postgres performance wildly beats SQLite, which I think is <laughs> to be expected. But to see it, um, I believe I calculated it to be a 50 times performance increase for concurrent logins, um, which is awesome. Um, so let me show you now how you can set this up. I'm going to give a bit of an off-the-cuff demo. So I have a smart proxy here. Um, and it's currently on Postgres. So if I show you my config file for the container gateway, you'll see I have a Postgres connection string. Now, I'll mention that the installer support for this is currently in progress. However, the gem for this version of the container gateway is now released in a 2.0 version. 
think it's a pretty big enhancement. And what's great is that we will handle the migration from SQLite to Postgres for you. We won't handle it going the other direction because we're hoping once you're on Postgres, you'll stay. Um, and as part of that, we'll also delete this database. Um, the database information really isn't terribly important. It's very easy to regenerate it during a smart proxy sync or even with a um, console command. So if I go into Postgres here, actually, let's, uh, let's do a little uh, demo. So I'm going to stop form and proxy. I'm going to go into Postgres. I'm going to drop the uh, container gateway database. Cool. Now I'm going to edit my YAML. Let's see if this works live. Um, actually, no, there's nothing I need to edit. Oh, no, I do need to edit this. So the database backend instead of Postgres, I want SQLite. I'm going to change this. And by the time I restart my proxy, let's try a podman login. So now we should see a database file. Let's see if this exists, because now it should be using SQLite instead of Postgres. So what we can do to migrate to Postgres um, the Postgres database is now gone. All I need to do is go back to my container gateway YAML. I'll change this to Postgres. And then when we restart it, it should automatically uh, transfer everything over. So let's do a just a logout and let's do a login. Oh, something weird happened. All right, so there was probably a configuration issue. This was a development machine, so I wasn't sure exactly what state it is in. But regardless, once this feature is released to you all, when you do this restart, what you'll see is the Postgres database will get created for you immediately, and then this database will be deleted off your machine, so it won't be hanging around. Um, and then we're also expecting Postgres, uh, or sorry, the installer support to come out. and that should be available for Catella 4.13. Um, and in fact, it might even make it to older versions, because all we'll have to do is, uh, well, we would have to backport the installer stuff, um, which that's to be determined if we want to do that. But backporting the container gateway uh, would be very easy. Um, and also, just one tip, if you ever see an issue for that like this, um, if you're trying to do something and it's giving a 404 from the proxy, um, that very likely means that whatever proxy feature you're trying to use has errored out and um, is no longer enabled on the smart proxy itself. So if you go into your, uh, your smart proxy UI and you look at the logs, you'll be able to see which features were disabled. So that's likely what happened in my case here. Um, but regardless, once you do this, uh, you should see greatly increased performance. And actually, let me um, let me go back to SQLite here. Let's just see. Um, I will show you. I, I should be able to reproduce the error. Um, I have this podman login spam thing that does 100 concurrent podman logins at the same time. Let's just see right now what happens if I run this. Um, what's likely to happen with 100 is that we will see um, a database lockup errors happen at some point. Um, this used to be much worse with, I uh, already see one error here, much worse with uh, before the improvements we added. Every so often we see these invalid username password errors. I believe that's due to the connection between the smart proxy and Foreman when it's logging in. That's something we're still digging into. So we can see the logins have succeeded, but it looks like it's hanging, which means the SQL database is locked up even now. Um, I think 50 concurrent is kind of the limit if you're using SQLite. And before, it was even worse. I think it was like 25. Yep, you see, so you get a 500. And 
I'm not demoing Postgres now because of the error earlier, but when I tested this, there were no errors. Um, so anyway, for any big container gateway users, I hope this will be helpful. Uh, and I will stop there. Are there any questions before I uh, continue on? All right. Cool. So yeah, then up next, we have the Foreman Resource Quota Plugin demo by Bastion. All right, thanks. So I'll just share my screen here too. which you should see now. And yeah, just let me know if it's not working. Otherwise, I'll just continue now. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Bastian. And uh, I've been working on a new plugin, or we've been working on a new plugin that uh, we already introduced earlier this year at the Conflict Management Camp. So for everyone who uh, did not make it there, um, I'll just give a short demo right now. So the plugin, I'm talking about is the Foreman Resource Quota plugin. And as the name says already, it's about resource management within Foreman. And more specifically, it's about the scenario that we want to deploy new hosts. So I just did like this little, little note here. So we have our Foreman instance, some compute resource configured to it, and a couple of users. And whenever a user does now want to deploy a new host or virtual machine on their compute resource, they just um, yeah use their foreman and and do so. But at some point, the the resources of this compute resource of our like hypervisor we have in here might be exhausted, and that's where this new uh, plugin comes into play. So with the new plugin, when the user is actually deploying a new host, they first have to to define a resource quota. So some quota where this new host is gonna be like counted into. And then Foreman is gonna calculate, okay, uh, how many how many hosts are already in this quota and what's the resources that the hosts use up already? And is this quota now exhausted or can, can you still deploy new hosts? And thereby, um, an administrator has the ability to, to limit the amount of CPU cores, memory, or disk space um, that a user is allowed to consume. And that's kind of the theory, but I also have a forklift instance running here. And with the resource quota plugin, we get under configure here this new um, page, which says resource quotas. And there we can uh, create a new one. I already created one here, my demo quota. And if I click on it, we have this um, React UI here where we can now yeah, configure or like maintain our quotas that we have. And this one uh, has a limitation on the number of CPU cores, as I said, and also on the memory, so the RAM that a user or a group of users um, is allowed to use. And we see already here this little thing says um, how many hosts are already assigned to this quota. So one host is already assigned. And we also see that the consumed resource is already like one core here and 50% of our um, memory is already in, in use. And now I just wanna show you uh, kind of an action. So when I wanna create a new host, I prepared, prepared some, some setup here on my local uh, libvirt. So I'm deploying an Ubuntu 2404 um, data currently, and now with the resource quota plugin, I would have to choose a quota down here. And then I can just say submit. And now it's doing in the background some kind of validation, and we see already that we're right back here because we have some uh, red box here, and it says the host exceeds the memory limit of my demo quota by one gigabyte, so the maximum six gigabyte. And now the user would uh, either have the chance to ask the administrator for some more memory, or um, they can just go on their virtual machine and I'm just gonna reduce the amount of, um, of memory that this uh, virtual machine is gonna use. So I just say like three gigabytes now, so it should just perfectly fit in there. And we say submit again. And yeah, this time the validation 
was running fine and we see that our new host is going to be deployed and i also have uh, my virtual my local virtual machine machine setup here and we see that there's now a new host this one just came up and it's currently yeah running the installation progress of ubuntu 24 um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. So that's kind of how the resource quota plugin can then help administrators to to kind of guarantee like a fair collaboration or that everyone is using only their fair share. And I just want to like point you guys to the to the repository that we have here. We already released this week the first version of the of the Ruby gem. And the next step would be for us to also get it into form and packaging. And we already have some issues here, but before getting it into form and packaging, I have like two more tasks that um, that we want to work work on. So, for example, like the test coverage, we introduced some more tests lately, but especially the the JavaScript uh, side, um, it would be nice to have some more there. And then another task, which I think we will like finish end of this month, beginning of that next month, is this async resource quota utilization um, trigger. Because currently, when I click on submit host, then the number of resources are calculated, so the, or the amount of resources um, of the existing hosts. And let's say there's not just like one host already part of the quota, but I don't know, 100 or something then it would iterate these 100 hosts during the host creation process and potentially delay the host creation process. And we don't want that. That's why um, we have this feature about this async resource quota utilization, and which is then store, it's going to store the, the last utilization and um, kind of asynchronously update this with a recurring logic, with like some, some task, like a cron job in the forming context. And yeah, such so that we can then just use this pre-calculated utilization value when when trying to validate um, a new host. Uh, and yeah, that's actually pretty much it already. So check it out. And uh, I, I think uh, there will be another demo when we implemented this and like the official official releases is going to happen, I think. And if, have you guys any questions? That was an awesome demo. Thank you. Um, I did have one question. I recall um, back at the configuration management camp demo, there was some discussion about um, that it can be a bit difficult to get disk space utilization uh, information. Um, I can't remember the exact conversation, but has there been any more uh, I don't know, discovery about that? Did you have to change the strategy at all for getting disk space utilization? Just curious about that. Yeah, so so I'm I have been testing it right now with, for example, Libvirt, but also um, uh, vSphere or like for, for for MWare, and there I was able to to implement the disk space utilization kind of um, a part, and I think next one would be like Proxmox to have a look there, and like the 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 fallback so yeah, it's kind of the difficult part there is that depending on the on the compute resource we have it's the disk space for example is differently stored within our host objects or like the compute resource objects and therefore we've been trying to kind of find what's the what's the best way or also kind of generic way on on getting that information and yeah, for for Libvirt and and vSphere, it's working fine. I'll see how it goes with um, Proxmox, and then yeah, it's kind of like like checking how the other um, compute resource types or like hypervisors um, are going. Yeah, but yeah, true. That's a that's a good point. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah fun to deal with the different compute resources. I didn't know that they would have different uh, ways that they stored their disk space. So yeah, hopefully y'all can find a more generic way that isn't too painful to develop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I'm, I'm positive about it, and I think we'll, we'll find some way there. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that.
All right, were there any more questions about the resource quota plugin? All righty. Well, last up then we have is Jeremy. We'll bring him back to talk about adding custom columns to the new uh, host list page. All right. Thanks again, Ian. Hi again, everybody. I'm going to attempt to share my entire screen here. Uh, so uh, this time I want to show you about a new feature that I've been working on uh, around adding custom columns to the host list page. Um, so first I wanted to show you the, the old existing uh, feature because a lot of it was actually in place already. So this is the old host page. And you can see here it's showing me name, host group, and a couple of columns from Patello. Uh, and that may not be the same columns that you see on your host page. The reason for that is because you can customize what columns are displayed on this page with this uh, manage columns here. Um, and so as you may know, we are working on combining the uh, host page that you're looking at now with the content host page uh, into a new page. The way we're doing that is by building a new page in React. So um, the task at hand here was to add this same feature uh, to the new page. So I should be able to manage which columns are displayed on the new page, just like I can on this page. Um, so it turns out this is a React component we're using here on this uh, on this page. So I was able to reuse a lot of this. And then I was also able to reuse the backend database portion, which I'll show you shortly. Um, so I'll show you the new feature. In order to see the new host page, there's a setting you have to turn on, uh, show new host overview page. So let me do that. And then when I go back to all hosts, I will see the new page. Um, and you'll notice that it shows the same columns that it was showing on the old page. And uh, the way we're able to do that is uh, we're looking at a backend database model called table preferences. I'll show you my terminal here. Hopefully you all can see that. Um, and so this is what table preferences looks like in uh, Rails. And it's you can see it's very simple. It's just showing, it's just storing the um, name, which is the name of the table that we're talking about, which in this case is hosts and then the names of the columns that that user prefers. And then there's a user ID that's tying it to a user. Um, so you may be wondering how that is implemented because obviously there's a lot more information on this page than uh, just the, the column name. Uh, so it turns out there that in, uh, in Ruby or in Rails, it's implemented with this pagelet system, and I'll briefly show you what that is like. Um, so this is what makes the old page work. So you would call this uh, this add pagelet thing with the host table column content and host table column header. The content uh, determines what the title of the column is. So in this case, name. Um, sorry, the, the header determines what the title of the column is in this case, name, and then the content determines what the content of the actual table cell is. Um, so you can see here that there's a callback, and it's a Ruby Lambda that takes in the host, and then it calls a Ruby method called name column on the host. And that's how we're able to get the host name into the table cell. So uh, how do I implement that in React? Uh, it's going to be tough, right? So it turns out. Um, most of this information is available in the API response. So it, it made it pretty easy for me in about 90% of cases. Um, so yeah, the difficulty here with a couple of the columns is that the, the uh, data is only available on the back end and it's not in the API response. But that, that was only the case for, I think, two or three columns out of the dozens that we're adding. So. Uh, I'm going to think about how to implement that later, but until then, we have this uh, 
mostly done. The solution I came up with in, in React is a little bit more uh, JavaScripty here. So here's what the implementation looks like in React. You have a column name, and this matches your uh, this matches the columns that are stored in the database here in table preferences. Uh, you have a title, which is the column header, and then you have a wrapper, which is uh, that that's what is in the table cell. And you have the full power of React here. So you can put uh, JSX here, you can put an entire React component, um, whatever you like, and it will call that for you when it's displaying the uh, table. Um, I realized I never actually show you, showed you the feature working. So if I add a couple columns here, I can see I now have boot time. And uh, if I go back to the old page, I can see I still have that new column. All right, so back to uh, how it's implemented. So you have your wrapper uh, is sorted. It determines the order of the columns. Um, it, sorry, it determines whether or not you can sort the columns. So I can, I have this little arrow thing here and certain columns I can sort by. Yeah, so this this determines what, if you if you have a, little arrow here that you can click. And then weight determines the order of the columns from left to right. So lower weights will get um, will show up on the left, higher weights will show up on the right. So that's how it's implemented in uh, Foreman Core. You may be wondering how can we implement this in plugins? How do plugins add columns? So the way we did that is I, I actually reused uh, some existing patterns from Foreman. There were a couple options. I looked at slot and fill. Um, I looked at the component registry that we have. Um, but it turns out that this sort of simpler uh, registration made a lot of sense to me. So what it is is there's there's a there's a column registry, and uh, all plugins have access to the same thing through this register columns function. Uh, and as you can see, Foreman is eating its own dog food here. We register our own columns just like any other plugin would. Uh, and once they're registered, they are in the official column list and they show up on the table. Uh, so if you're in a plugin, like if you're Catello, you do the same basic sort of thing. I recommended that it go in your global index.js file, but really it could go anywhere. Um, so what you do is you just import this register columns file from Foreman React, and then you have your column data somewhere, uh, and then you call register columns on it. Um, and that's how we get the data in there from plugins. I was able to, um, I was able to use this for most of the columns. Like I mentioned before, there were a couple, I think power status and virtual, in Foreman Core, and then I think there's one from RH Cloud that I need to think about how to implement later. Uh, but other than that, that's uh, that's the new customizable columns feature. I'll see if there's any questions. And uh, thanks. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for the great demo, Jeremy. Were, were there any questions? Or any questions for anyone? for that matter, since uh, it's the end of the demo. All right, awesome. And I'll have to mention, I just realized why my demo didn't work. I forgot to recreate the Postgres database. So anyway, hooray. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for the amazing demos. This was great. Um, if you have any more questions that come up in your mind, you can find us on Matrix or the community website. Uh, and yeah, we'll uh, see you all in three weeks at the next demo. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ian.